everybody. So today we have Steve Hall back on the podcast. How are you doing, man? I'm pretty good. Uh, considering everything that's going on in my life right now, it's a, we may touch on it, but it, it's a manic time, but I'm still, yeah, I'm being pulled left, right and center, but there's some really good stuff bodybuilding wise, yeah. which is probably what we're more talk about going on. Uh, life is a bit stressful at the moment. I won't lie. Okay. Which we could also touch on. Uh, but yeah, overall, I'm a positive human right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, yeah. Let's get into it. So, I mean, most people who are familiar with my podcast are familiar with you and your podcast. I was looking, and if we combine, um, if we include like group podcasts as well, this is your sixth time on the podcast. Oh, so wow. It's been a while. It's been, uh, I guess, three years since we first met. So, it's pretty cool. That's bad. And uh, I know it is weird, man. It is weird. And, uh, so you, I'm trying to think when we first met, you had already competed. That actually might have been the last time. Was that the last time you competed? I don't know. That was in 2018. So when was the last time you competed? 2017. Okay. So yeah, so you actually yeah. had not competed as long as I've known you. And so now, and that was actually a discussion I've had with other people. It's like, you know, okay, he's bulking up. He's looking huge. What's going to happen when you diet down? Right. You know, will it will it result in anything? And, and obviously it did. So Same uh, thoughts are going through my head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why don't you dive into that a little bit about, you know, what was your, obviously not the entire off season because it was like four years, but like, you know, what did that look like in terms of getting up to a high new weight and then dieting back down? Yeah, it was, it's interesting because I actually planned to compete last year, which I don't know if we've talked about, um, but I basically was on the way. Uh, so I got to 10 pounds. Actually, no, I was only about five pounds or so off where I am now. So I was okay. very close to stage condition last year. And I basically pulled the plug because we all know why. Yeah. So uh, before that, though, my I think my peak off-season weight got to 205 pounds. Okay. And... Before 2017, I hadn't got over 190. So I definitely pushed to a heavier wow. body weight than I'd ever seen before. And it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> horrible, <laughs> I tell you. Uh, it's, I, I, it's no joke to say that I'm more comfortable now at whatever body fat percentage wow. I am than I was at that. Wow. That was horrendous. Force feeding is much worse, I find, than restricting. Like right now I enjoy all my food and I like that. <laughs> yeah. I can eat a carrot and I'm like, Hey, it tastes all right. Wow. Whereas then I could wake up and like, you'd give me the nicest food like Domino's pizza. It's my yeah. favorite thing. Okay. But even eating like a medium Domino's. I was like, Oh God. Domino's gets hate on, but I had some recently and it was pretty solid, man. I'm a fan. What was that for? For a Domino's pizza. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm a fan because I think like I'm Italian. So my dad, you know, is always like, yeah. it's not real pizzas and you know, but honestly I like it. I don't know. Maybe I like cheap food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, there's something about it. There's something about that. Yeah. I am a big fan of like Neapolitan style, proper sourdough. Mm -hmm. I've been to Naples and like I ate two pizzas a day for the weekend. Yeah. We were there. <laughs> it was like incredible. Yeah. Uh, so but yeah, I wasn't even, I wasn't enjoying my food at all. And I was feeling like lethargic and I pushed through longer than I think a reasonable person would. Mm. Like I, you, you think what I was doing there and I went through probably a good solid four months at least of force feeding and feeling mm. nauseous regularly and it's still managing how to progress things. I mean, you are big for sure, but your body fat, because I, you know, I, it tends to be, I mean, there's something to be said for overall weight, but for a lot of people, it's like a body fat that their body doesn't necessarily want to go past. And you were, I mean, not, you weren't like shredded at 205, but you weren't fat. You were fat for you, but like yeah. you were still relatively lean. And it, it's amazing that it was that hard for you. And, and you said you even feel better, like fully contest the condition pretty much. That's unusual. Yeah, for sure. It's, I'm definitely a bit of a kind of quirk in the system there mm -hmm. in terms of like on the bell curve, I'm definitely more towards feeling better, leaner than the average person, which I think you can see throughout my life. Like I've never really been like quote unquote fat. Uh, I've, I've always been that skinnier kid ectomorphic in that sense. Yeah, and yeah, so sure. dieting kind of comes almost naturally and yeah, I mean, it says it, it says it right there that I feel better at the extreme of this yeah. body fat than at what would be considered maybe an average body fat for a guy. Right. And yeah, my body just didn't want to go there. It just didn't want to push up. But I think pushing into new body weights was a good move, especially because progression was still good. Performance in the gym was still good. And it meant that my kind of from 2017, I very gradually went through from finishing prep at like 160 
165 pounds right that gave me a long runway up to 205 yeah. basically and i did do some mini cuts within that right. probably more than i would in hindsight now looking at have recommended someone to do like there were yeah. times where i was like i suppose for me it was like a like a point where it's not a terrible time to mini cut, but for the average person, like you wouldn't be mini right. cut, you'd be like, you're already pretty lean still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would have probably removed maybe one of those at least. So I think I did like three or something um, during that period of time. But I've written it somewhere on Instagram. It was the number of weeks. I was definitely, I think it was over 85% of my off season was in a surplus. Yeah. Which is a really good chunk of time. So that's one big takeaway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one thing that I do because like I have, I'm surprised by the number of clients who ask me if they should do a mini cut because mini cuts really only became more popular in the last few years. And um, at, at least like by terminology. And yeah. a lot of times I'm just like, no, like stop asking about a mini cut. Like I'm not <laughs> that you should never do them, but I think they are, you know, people will put on a little bit of body fat and like, oh, it's time to cut. Right. And it's like, dude, just keep pushing, you know, but at least yeah. you overall, you know, you had years of overall steady incline going up. So, yeah. And that's where I consider mini cuts are done right versus wrong. If someone's mini cutting to bring them back down to like the same body weight all the time, I think it's a surefire way to spin your wheels. Whereas yeah. if it is like you come up, come down a little bit, come up. So it's overall, yeah. if you zoom out, you're like, oh, that's a linear trend up. Mm -hmm. Eventually you're going to need a long extended cut. Yeah. Whereas I think the allure for a lot of people is like, oh, I'm just going to mass a mini cut forever and mm -hmm. I'll never need to do a long cut because long cuts suck and no one yeah. wants to do that. And I think that's a, you need a real long purposeful mass because it's yeah. such a slow process as a natural. Um, I just had Mike Isretel on for a Q and A and he was telling me how he gained, I don't know, it was like 15 pounds of muscle within a year. And I was like, man, it took me <laughs> four years to gain less than that. <laughs> it's yeah. just, and that's good going. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's your progress has been, I think a lot of us were surprised, honestly, because you were how much heavier on stage? Close to 10 pounds. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy, yeah. dude. And, and you were, and so I was talking with um, Brian Borstein about this and he was saying like, oh, you know, I think it's because he's so dialed in and everything. I was like, well, you are so dialed in, but also weren't you only like seven years into lifting at your last competition? So I have been lifting, officially lifting since I was basically 16. Okay. And I'm now 31. Okay. So I've, I have actually been in the gym for a long time, but I'm not doing it like what Lyle McDonald, he, he kind of said, like, I can't remember what the term is, like properly, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and consistently. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so he has the term somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you were in your 2017 competition, then, so technically you were already, you know, 10 ish years into it then. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's, it's always hard to know how long somebody has been lifting in terms of like, cause some people are like, well, I was lifting for sports, right. Or I was lifting, but I was like half ass in it or something. Yeah. So, and that obviously plays into like, like when I talk about, you know, and I think Alberto had a, a post on this recently saying like, you know, the first five years are where you make most of the gains, but that's like, you know, your serious five years, you know, we all know people who have lifted for years and they haven't done anything, you know, and it's amazing how it's even, even if you're doing the right routine, the calories thing and, and the food is so important because I've tried the whole, like, I didn't call it a mini cut, but back in like 2011, when I was probably 15 pounds less muscle than I have now, I tried going from 170 up to 175 over, you know, two months and then down to 170 and then up to one. And I didn't go anywhere. I just kept yeah. trying to do that and nothing happened. So even if you're well below your potential, it still can just not result in anything, you know? That definitely happened to me because between 2014 to 2017, I didn't really gain any stage weight. Mm. I look better. I was a better bodybuilder. And this is what natural bodybuilders often talk about. Like you might be right. the same stage weight, but you look better. But I have gone from, I definitely look better this time round, significantly better versus 2017. So my off season this time round has been way more productive mm. and I'm further into it. And I think it's like you just said there, I just, some of the basic stuff I just applied better. Yeah. So the consistent calorie surplus, it's not something I was great at between 2014 to 2017. I stayed yeah. too lean. I spanned my wheels, just trying to maintain, just kind of training hard. I was kind of doing power building. I wasn't ultra specific towards bodybuilding. Whereas my off season after 2017, I was just like, right, let's just get this shit into yeah. gear. <laughs> kind of kicked me up the ass, kind of being like, all right, you've done better. You've done all right but you can do better. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of what this off season has been as a case of just like dialing everything in, uh, being ultra specific towards bodybuilding, not getting 
and, and sticking to what I know is working for me and kind of the principles that I know make sense. Yeah. And along the way, individualizing it and learning that, that kind of what it means for me in terms of, I don't know, how many sets do I really need for this muscle group? Right. Am I really training to that RER that I'm meant to be training to on mm -hmm. this one? Right. And I just got much better at the process of being a, a proper bodybuilder during this off season. One of the things we talk about with you know, sometimes people have these jumps in stage weight, like uh, Jeff Alberts, I don't remember what year it was, but a while back, but when he was already like 20 years into it, he put on 10 pounds of stage weight. And uh, I remember well before he even said this, I, you know, because one of my friends was like, oh, look, you can still gain so much naturally, even at that stage. And I said, dude, like he didn't gain that necessarily in his off season. And he said this himself, he maintained more while dieting down. And that was the big thing for him. Now for you, I'm sure you actually did gain a lot of actual muscle, but if you had to guess, how much do you think it was like gaining more muscle? For instance, at when you cut down to, let's say 190, how much more muscle do you think you had at 190 compared to 190, you know, three or four years ago? And how much of it was really just a retention due to better dieting? It's a good question. And it's probably one that's unanswerable. Mm -hmm. I would say I'm fairly confident that my last dieting phases were pretty decent in terms of ma making sure I retained muscle. I definitely like you get better every time, mm -hmm. but I think the majority was off season based versus a better approach to stage. Yeah. But my approach to stage has definitely been better. And I think with the, it will tell it in its own way, but. I'm at that point where I want to get to elite conditioning. That's kind of like my target now mm -hmm. where I've got good conditioning and it's winning me show. Well, it won me that show really yeah. uh, in part with probably my back as well, but to kind of win British titles, I need something freaky. And yeah. that's where I think the tell will be in there in terms of how good am I at retaining muscle when I'm getting to the point that's hurting me a lot. Yeah. Um, but no, I, d I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's a good it's, question. It's, yeah, but I think I think I built the majority of it versus retaining more. Okay, that's fair. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting to see like the levels of leanness that one can get because you obviously are super lean, and in like you know it looks like you have striated glutes and all of that, which I know you know comes for different people at different times in dieting. But how much lighter? Like, are you trying to get to that next level of conditioning this season? Yes. So okay. I currently have five and a half weeks until finals for the federation. I just qualified with, with that first place win that I got this weekend. Um, I have another British finals, but it conflicts with another federation, which is okay. annoying. So I'm, I'm doing the WMBF and the UKDFBA, uh, which are basically five and a half weeks away and uh, seven and a half weeks away. So I've got time uh, okay. to keep taking body fat off. And so I now, would if like you didn't to win first place. Would you have not been able to do these other ones? Uh, no. So the top three actually in my category all got a qualification. Okay. And I came third actually at the BMBF, which was the show I did two weeks earlier as like a kind of, I'm doing this and I'm yeah. just kind of ended it late and I got a qualification for their final. So it's a case okay. of it's at the judge's discretion. Hmm. How many of the people they give, sometimes they give, like the top four, even like really? all the qualification for finals, if they think that person's got potential. Mm. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the timeline that I have. And I am not really targeting a kind of rate of loss or a particular scale weight. It's more of a look at this stage because I'm losing probably such small amounts of body fat where probably the water weight is influencing the scale more than, uh, the, the body yeah, weight. Sure. So it's more of a case of, I know I'm in a deficit. I know I'm digging and maybe refeeds are going to clear it up. I'm kind of getting into a bit of new territory because I'm in a position okay. where I'm as lean as I've ever been and I want to get leaner and I have never kind of ventured into that yeah, um, yeah, zone. Yeah. So I've been talking to like I had Brian Miner recently on the podcast and we had our round table between Alberto Nunez and uh, Andy Morgan, uh, not mm -hmm. Andy Morgan, Andrew Chappelle uh, about kind of, can you be too lean too soon? Mm -hmm. That sort of discussion. And Alberto has his client Dirk. I don't know if you saw the post where he's basically sure. very shredded and he was shredded like weeks ago. I'm actually, I think I did see that. Fully yeah. striated glutes. And uh, they're kind of reversing calories up now, kind of eating into the show. It's that kind of metabolic building phase that uh, Dr. Joe Kongeski would talk about. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping I can get to that point, maybe 
like two or three weeks out, at least two weeks out from the kind of finals. So it'd be about a case of like three weeks more digging with then a couple of weeks, hopefully to that will bring out that fuller conditioning where you kind of, yeah. don't know, the metabolic rate builds a little bit. You fill out glycogen stores, you reduce like cortisol and fluid retention. So you get like even leaner mm-hmm. visibly, even though you're eating more, it's kind of like that. Per- that's kind of like a long peak, really. Peak week can be a week. Sure. Yeah. It'd be like multiple weeks of just eating up slightly yeah. slowly. <laughs> how uh, how many calories did you drop down to? So this is probably going to piss some people off. Oh man, my I'm low days, <laughs> my low days are at two thousand six hundred calories, what? and my refeed days are up. I actually don't know. My carbs go from three hundred to five hundred. So wow. yeah, are you doing a ton of cardio? No cardio, <laughs> dude. Get out of here. This is the end of the podcast. Signing <laughs> off. <laughs> wow. That's one of the highest I've heard for a natural athlete. Wow. That, I mean, this alludes to your question of the dieting process being better. Yes, because no wonder you feel better than when you're bulking up. <laughs> so, <laughs> <eating a ton. laughs> um, so I've used energy flux and kind of that concept of you, you can be at the same deficit, but if you're eating more and moving more, you're probably going to get better results and feel better. So I kind of use that to my advantage via using the weighted vest, Mm -hmm. which I wear for 10 hours at the moment, Uh, or it's probably not quite 10 hours, but I wear it like for the first 10 hours of my day, but take it off for training and posing. Mm -hmm. So that helps keep my energy expenditure up. And then walking to and from the gym and my dog gets me to an average of about 15,000 to 16,000 steps a day. So that combination of the training I'm doing, the steps, the weighted vest is keeping my energy, energy expenditure much you higher. You wear the vest the to and from the gym? Yeah. So I wear it for, I, I'm also stood. So I have a standing desk here, which uh, I sit down from like 4.35 PM. But I'm up at like 6.30 with then stood with the weighted vest on okay. up until that point. Wow. Okay. How much is it weigh? 10 kilos now. I started with five okay. for a few hours and slowly kind of added like duration and then increase the weight, but spread it between five to 10. So I don't have one of the ones that you can just like add nicely to oh, it. Yeah, so like yeah, as yeah. you lose, you can just add. So yeah. I had to transition between five to 10 kilos. So oh, you have separate vests. Yeah. So oh, I basically okay. wore the five kilos for like three hours and the other one for three hours. Uh, okay. I don't know. Just yeah, like slowly transitioned so. into it, whatever it was. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like I've, I've seen Eric Lee Salazar and Krieger talking about it. Um, I haven't seen too many other people doing it. I mean, I like the concept of it. And the steps thing always amazes me in terms of like you got you and Abel talk about getting 15,000 plus steps a day. And like, I guess, I mean, both of you guys walk all the time and I'm like pretty sedentary. So I get like yeah. 5,000 steps a day, you know? So, yeah. um, and it's funny, the days I do, like I was just at the beach and the days I do get 15,000, I think like, how are you guys doing this every day? Like, I feel like <laughs> I was just walking all day, but I guess yeah. it's just, you know, I mean, you, you obviously work from home, right? I mean, you're able to do it. Do you have like a, some people do like standing treadmill and stuff like that. Do you ever do that? I considered it when I got COVID because I got COVID in prep. Um, I don't know how long ago that was now, but it feels like ages ago. Mm-hmm. So that was when I, I was locked in and I was like, how the fuck am I going to get my steps anywhere yeah. near where they need to be? Uh, but I kind of, I, th- I, I'm thankful that I didn't get one because it just would have been kind of pointless. Apart from when it rains, sometimes it's tempting to like sure. <laughs> try and find a treadmill or something, but no, I don't have that. Okay. Um, I just commute. I commute to the gym twice because I still train AM and PM. Wow. So that helps top them up. And then I walk my dog, I don't know, like an hour a day, which then gets them up, up there as well. And then London is very much like walkable kind of city. So mm-hmm. on weekends and stuff, normally I'm kind of walking around and just out and about and try and stay away from the flat as much as possible, yeah. essentially. Right, right. So um, you mentioned 2,600 on your low days. Now, is protein fat the same on your high days and you just add 200 grams of carbs? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So basically you're adding 800 calories. So you're talking 3,400. So how many refeeds are you doing per week? Uh, Two at the moment. Two. Okay. So I remember there was, you know, this refeed debate has gone on forever, but you know, you and Abel were two of the people who told me you didn't do them. And I was really surprised. And I have to say this cut and last cut, I haven't, I've still done them, but they've been more like, uh, like just life circumstances. Oh, we're going somewhere. So I throw in a refeed rather than like every week I have two refeeds or something. 
honestly, it's been super easy to cut. I haven't lost any strength. Like it's really been so, and I stand by what I said a few months ago, which is that I still think they serve a purpose, especially the leaner you get. I really do think the leaner you get, it's going to be probably more important. But if you're going from like 20% to 10%, I, I really don't think it makes much of a difference. But what made yeah. you decide to incorporate them this time? So just because uh, I think it was really the debate that I had on my channel with Jackson Pios, Menno, Alberto, and Brian. And I just really struggled to see the downsides of refeeds if they don't cause you to binge. And I think if you do a refeed kind of quote unquote correctly uh, for a bodybuilder, at least who's getting lean for stage, it should just be like, don't incorporate tons of highly palatable food. Don't try yeah. and like, I don't know, go to extreme if it fits your macros, that sort of thing. Yeah. And you kind of just have more of your boring food basically. And mm. maybe some like cereal or something, something not super exciting. Right. I, I really struggled to see downsides and I'm someone who like, I'm not going to touch wood. I'm not going to binge. I've never binged my life. It's just not in my nature. I'm not that yeah. sort of person. I'm very robotic. You give me a number, I'll hit it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, there sounds like there's quite a bit of upsides to taking these refeeds possibly that at least anecdotally people have seen, I should just not like rule them out. And mm -hmm. so I decided, I was like, well, they seem like a pretty clever way to at least reduce your calorie deficit. So as you get leaner, a lot of people adapt, but like mm -hmm. their metabolism adapts. And so like what was a decent calorie deficit is now no longer. Right. Uh, but with the weighted vest that I was adding, I was kind of compensating for that in its own way. So to slow my rate of loss, I just incorporated refeeds. So it was a case of, I don't want to be losing at 1% mm -hmm. of body weight anymore. I want to be losing closer to like 0.5 or what have you. Yeah. Let's chuck in a couple of maintenance days. And then I was interested to see if they did provide me more kind of data for uh, like refeed, uh, sorry, for peak weeks or anything like that, that kind of people will talk about and just trial them. Uh, you know, when you're like self-coach, you want to like just kind of give different things a go. And yeah. I think it's been really handy just to at least try it for myself. And so I can't really speak to how much they've helped. I do enjoy them, but you're going to enjoy them. Right. So I think they're certainly psychologically helpful. Uh, I can't speak to comparing them though to like previous times because I didn't use them and I got right. pretty lean my last prep as well. But I don't think I was clever with my training during my last prep. Uh, not as clever of, or not as, I haven't done it as diligently as I have this time around. I don't think I understood the training process as well as I understand it this time. So maybe I would have seen some benefits this time around versus last time had I not done what I did with my training, which was basically... I'd say excessive variation, changing things meso to meso. Last and time. Then, yeah. And then uh, excessive volume, just like adding sets where I just shouldn't have been adding any sets. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That was one thing that I kind of disagreed a little bit with that I heard Mike and even Jared talk about was, and, and I asked Jared on his Instagram, he didn't really give me much of a response, but they were talking about how during a diet is a great time to go higher reps and higher volume to maintain a stimulus for muscle and higher exercise variation, again, is a new stimulus for muscle uh, maintenance. And to me, I'm like, dude, if, if I'm dieting, I want to do what got me the muscle. And I mean, we, we have a plethora of data showing that you can maintain muscle on less volume than it required to get it. So I'm not saying that it, it wouldn't work, but I certainly wouldn't say, okay, we're cutting time to add sets, add, like go to higher reps and change the exercise variation. Personally, I don't know how much of that you did or didn't do, but that's kind of my stance on it. I would say quite a bit in that previous prep, which I did consult with Jared with as well, which might kind of go into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I lost like a bunch of muscle, but because exercises were changing quite frequently, establishing proper RERs was kind of challenging. Right. Uh, and also like just anchoring performance metrics was challenging. So I mm -hmm. kind of could have been ignorant to performance losses yeah. and could have been not working as hard as I should have. Right. Whereas if I was keeping a movement, which I have been this time around, keeping movements much more static, I yep. can see if my performance is dropping or not. And therefore I get a really good understanding of, I mean, if I'm maintaining performance, I can be pretty sure I'm not losing muscle here. Totally. Whereas if I change a movement, it becomes so much harder to know if you're losing it. So I've only done exercise variation 
more frequently maybe for isolation movements, although they haven't changed a ton. And then if a movement's becoming obviously stale and I've had it in for like six months, which was like my deficit barbell bent of a row, I just rotated that out because it just was feeling pretty bad yeah. basically. Yeah. So I put in a dumbbell bent of a row, but like my hack squats, they've stayed. Uh, like my main pr like pressing movement has been a machine press the whole time. I don't want to change it mm -hmm. because I'm kind of like, I'm scared that if I change it, I'm going to not know. I'm in exactly. no man's land in terms of, whether or not I've lost performance on it and I'm just in a good groove with it. So I don't want to change it out. So, and not only and do you have, so to me, I mean, I totally agree with that because it's a great metric. Right. And even if like, cause I'm big on measurements, as a lot of people know, but it's like, obviously your measurements are going to go down as you're dieting, if you lose 20 pounds, your arms are going to get smaller. So, you, you know, having that strength, assuming you're keeping constant form is a great way, but not only does it make it harder to gauge if you've lost strength. And, and this is just kind of like a theory of mine. I, and I can't prove this, but we talk a lot about how, when you're gaining and you put a new exercise in, you'll gain strength, but it's these neurological adaptations, right? So maybe let's just say it's a lift. You go from hundred to 115 pounds. Maybe you haven't actually gained muscle, right? If it's initial, my thought is almost like if I'm dieting and I'm doing one exercise and you know, that, that strength is stagnant. Okay, cool. I'm maintaining. I switched to a new exercise. Well, let's say it's hundred pounds again. And then next week it's hundred pounds and next week's hundred pounds. For all I know, I've only maintained strength because of the neurological adaptations. And I've actually, it was almost like my body's chance to lose muscle because it was like, yeah. Hey, we can just maintain this performance with neurological adaptations versus like the bench press you've been doing for 12 years. We have to maintain muscle. Now, I can't prove that theory, but that's just one of the other reasons I'm afraid to change in the middle of a cut. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you on it. And the way I circumvent maybe the need for the kind of keeping up with some of that novelty benefit, because I do think there's a benefit to novelty that keeps up stimulus and can hopefully help with fatigue is maybe that I keep the movement in there, but rather than doing like the heavy, like I was doing heavy sets of like less than 10 reps on hack squats, for example, and I've just dropped in I, i'm keeping one set of that and then i'm doing a reduction in load of 10 to 20 percent to try and kind of mitigate and if i'm maintaining the kind of top set i'm feeling more confident that i'm also maintaining the muscle mass whilst mm -hmm. i'm getting very good stimulus from lowering the load but doing slightly higher reps which i have found to be a better stimulus to fatigue trade-off when you are dieting where heavy yeah. loading just gets horrible so that's now, i don't know if i missed it are you doing that on all of your sets or you said you do a top set and then you back off so not on all of them so it's on at the moment on like if it's a seven to ten rep range which is normally my lower rep range on like a hack squat um in my past couple of mesocycles i've just rather than doing like two sets or three sets of that i'll do one set of the heavy and then maybe okay. one or two kind of uh at 10 to 20 percent reduction in load and I okay. just like do an AMRAP to the RAR. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause I didn't realize you did that, but that's kind of something I do where, um, mine is a little bit more ego based if I'm being honest, but you know, there's some of these exercises where I do still care how much I can overhead press, how much I can bench, you know, all these things. So my first set, I'll be a little loose with form. Like it's like how much, and again, I admit like that's somewhat ego, but I just kind of want to see what I can get. But then the next two I'll back off quite a bit. And I'll go to what I know I can do with pristine form and usually higher reps and everything. And that's more, like you said, where it's like, I, I know I'm getting the good, you know, stimulus to fatigue ratio and all of that. Um, but I still like to get that initial marker performance. And I think even, um, Martin Birkin way back would have that where like, you know, every four to six weeks, you're, you're testing your strength on these things as a gauge. Cause if you don't have that, not that you're not going to progress, but it really, I think it is helpful to have those gauges. Yeah. Yeah. I've just. So my, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I agree. I think that's one of the things that I see a lot of the um, kind of enhanced side and the kind of intensity guys doing where they do that kind of top set and a back off set. I don't call it the same thing, but I think the rationale is very similar mm -hmm. uh, with that. And then, yeah, the other thing I haven't done that I did last time was, and theoretically this is spot on in terms of your max recoverable volume doesn't uh, sorry shrinks essentially the leaner you get the longer you've been dieting you can't recover from as much volume so set additions should come down so your average volume should be less during a cut than a mass yeah and i didn't really do that 
last prep whereas mm. this time round i've like my set editions are very rare um and it's just to make sure that i'm maintaining performance maintaining some stimulus in terms of like making sure i feel disrupted and i, I get some of the pump i do like those metrics within my training and i've still been getting those mm. they've still been useful because i think they can probably become a bit <laughs> like unhelpful during a cut because yeah. some people just don't get either of them at some point and that could be a sign they're losing muscle. I guess you could argue, could be like, you need to do more. But then if your performance is dropping because you can't do more, then right. it's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's a tough gauge. Painful, or... Yeah, when when you're dieting, because if you're bulking, you know, you could say, okay, eat more, sleep more, or, or maybe you do need to add more sets. If you're losing strength when dieting, it's a tough call as a coach because it's like, well, do you add more because you need more stimulus like, during a diet? Maybe not. Is it because you're under recovering? Or is it just, hey, this is just kind of part of the process for yeah. some people, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think the time will come probably in the next few weeks where I am really struggling to maintain performance, mm. uh, which I'm really not looking forward to. Have you lost I'm any? Super, I haven't lost it. Uh, only on that barbell bent over row. But okay. I think part of that, I don't know if you find this, if you do bent over rows, uh, but part of the reason I think maybe that has happened is because I tend to, I talk about this to clients all the time with a bent over row, you kind of start and then you kind of, you progress, you progress, you progress. But as you're progressing, your form also gets a little looser because it's Always, hard yeah. to have pristine form with that movement because mm -hmm. it's such a yep. challenging strength curve. So then I just get to a point where I'm like, I'm using too much momentum now. So I have to take two steps back to hopefully yeah. take three steps forward. So I was kind of in that position. I was like, is this a strength loss because I'm in a deficit and I've lost fat and lost muscle? Or is it just because I'm in that position? I was like, fuck it, I'm moving this movement out. I've had it in for over six yeah. months. It's yeah. worth just putting something new in. So, I just posted and all my on... other back movements are maintaining. So Okay. Yeah, I just posted on my Instagram some of what I do for back. And I just said, I really, I mean, deadlifts were always a big thing for me. I don't do them as much now. Um, but pull up, pull up variations and rows. But like, I like the one arm dumbbell row. I feel like I get like really good okay. range of motion with that. The barbell row, I just, I, I mean, obviously it's a great exercise. Obviously people have, you know, built huge backs from it. I just, you know, it, it is more fatiguing. I feel like, you know, it is more strenuous on the body, but then also, like you said, it's, it's very hard. Like I remember I posted a video. I mean, I was like really young, like on a forum, like, like, how is my form here? And I have, I was like, you know, I was like 110 pounds rowing like 115 or whatever. And, um, and people were saying, oh, you could have pushed so much harder but it's like, dude, but this exercise, the way, like you said, the strength curve is I was trying to do this pristine form. And those last few inches, you have to use weight that is really easy for the first like 80% of it. If you want this slow contraction at the top. And it's just, I don't know. I, I never really felt it as like this great exercise. And as you said, you put weight on and you slowly, the form gets worse. So obviously it, it can be a good exercise. I just, I never felt a great connection with it. It's really funny. I'll, I'll put up a video of like me bent over rowing on my story. There'll be some people that will comment and be like, man, you had so much left there. And there'd be mm -hmm. other people being like, man, you broke down re like four, yeah. like four reps ago. So right. it's such a, a divisive movement, but I don't know if this is the same for you, Dave, but I'm at that level where I like know when my form is becoming sloppy because the stimulus is now like shifting from my back musculature to like, other areas and yeah. I just I can feel my hips starting to come in I'm having to shag the weight a little bit so I know my cutoff point and yeah it's just like I said when you use it I find this every time I use a bent over row variation I just milk it out milk it out milk it out and I get to a point where I'm like man I'm just my technique is breaking down a bit more than I'd like I even need to reset this back and then go mm -hmm. again which I do sometimes do or if it's been in long enough I'm just like right I'm gonna find a new variation that I'm I'm happy with but I do, it's hard because you could say I could have used different movements and built my back with another way, which I'm sure I could. I think there's mm. lots of roads to roam, but my back is definitely something that's come up massively. And I've put a big emphasis on keeping a bent over Rome like in my program the whole way. But that's not to say that's the same for everyone. Like for sure. you, it might be the one arm row that's the the kind of yeah. the answer for you. So yeah, I, I try not to draw too many conclusions from an N equals one. <laughs> Yeah, right. For sure. So I didn't actually realize I was talking with, I think it was Brian again about your strength levels. Like I, and I knew you were strong, but I guess I see a lot of machines that you do. And so it's like, it's hard to gauge. Okay. He's doing this, yeah. you know, one machine. I, I don't know what that relates to. Um, but I saw a video from you, like, cause I, I, you recently had a squad video where 
Um, obviously it was in kilograms, but I assume, I think it was like in the mid two hundreds or something, but then I saw you like a year and a half ago, do three sixty five ish for eight, like clean, good form. And I was like, dude, I did not know you were that strong. Um, so did you like specifically like drop weight or. I don't even know what, uh, what movement are you referring to back for squats? squats for back squats? Yeah. Yeah. This was like a high bar back squat. I believe you had. It might have been like 364 pounds. I don't remember what it would be in kilos exactly. But um, does that sound right to you? Like about that strength? Yeah, like 180 kilos, something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I would have worked up to that. I, I'm not a bad squatter, uh, but I find they don't develop my quads that well. I think that's partly why I have such big adductors uh, or yeah, adductors and um like glutes, because I think I mostly glute and adductor it up yeah. and not so much quads. <laughs> so I've been much more focused on using the hack squat since I've had one available to me. I find I get way more quad versus the rest. Okay. So yeah, I'm not, I, I'm okay at back squatting. Like I can do a reasonable amount and deadlifting. I'm pretty decent at deadlifting when I, yeah. I would do that off the floor. Uh, benching, it's never going to be a strong point. I always do just you use know some of your numbers of when you were like, obviously we can all drop the weight by 25% and use pristine form and everything. But when you were like really trying to go heavier, uh, like I said, the highest I saw you was maybe the 180 for eight or so, 180 kilograms for eight squat. But how about deadlift and bench or overhead press? Do you, do you even know at this point? Uh, so this is great because Abel actually sent me a message. I think he sent out to a few people asking yeah, yeah, for like yeah. my numbers. And I was like, mm. fuck, I don't have a clue. <laughs> So I was just like, uh, I just ignored it. Unfo I should have gone back to him and been like, I um, but I, it's what, when you flick into a message and you then forget yeah, right, about it. Right. Um, unfortunately, I haven't over overhead pressed for, I don't know, I hate the movement, I hate it. Barbell overhead press, yeah. yeah okay. uh, even any overhead, like, oh, I, really? I machine pressed a few times here and there, and I'm mostly as like a high incline. Okay. I, don't, I even don't enjoy that at all. So you do um, laterals almost entirely? So I do, yeah, side side lateral raises. Yeah, okay. that's an upright rows, uh, Y raises. They're kind of my bread and butter for, for wow. the side delts. Okay. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe I'm missing out by not doing the overhead press, but yeah. I just, I hear good reasons why it's not necessary mm -hmm. and it fits my bias. And so right. I'm just like, man. <laughs> well, I, it's funny because like, you know, what you excel out or what your thing is like people gravitate towards so like because you are so clearly just about like the bodybuilding and the aesthetics and all of that and so like it, it sounds to me like you only care about strength as far as it you know helps that bodybuilding goal but it doesn't really doesn't, yeah i don't have any ego with it and that's how i started it was just that like i didn't you know whatever you get positive feedback on you tend to gravitate towards and so i just was never that physically impressive but like my strength for you know my size and everything was pretty good and so it's, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I actually even care that much about the strength other than it's like, it's my thing. I have like a bit of a calling card for, you know, to some right. degree. Um, like I don't see a lot of people overhead pressing over 200 pounds for reps or, you know, I just did uh pull ups, three plates for three reps, which was actually my first time trying that, but I was pretty happy with it. And, um, but you don't, you know, that's kind of like my thing, but I totally understand from your bias, like you compete in bodybuilding and not powerlifting, like it makes sense. And, and frankly, there's more longevity in, in that, you know, you can do a lot of stuff for bodybuilding and maintain or even continue to grow without breaking your body. Whereas like powerlifting, I think even Eric Helm said, it's like when you sign up for powerlifting, you're basically just agreeing to slowly degrade your body, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah it's i think part of it is what i was always bad at overhead press even before this but i have a i, I may have mentioned it in a previous podcast i have a slap tear in mm. my left shoulder okay. which makes me inherently unstable in all pressing movements especially overhead press mm. so okay. it just is it doesn't like it at all um so that's probably partly why i do know i'm pretty sure when i conventional deadlifted a while ago a long time ago this is years now i think i got like somewhere like 180 for 10 conventional okay. deadlift nice um for pretty decent like not powerlifting style reps for like yeah 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 pretty controlled i i probably would look back and be like they could be better for hypertrophy but right again i don't deadlift off the floor for hypertrophy for many reasons uh at the moment and then i think bench press i was actually really happy to get 
100 kilos for like 10 reps. I'm pretty sure I've done that fairly okay. comfortably. Yeah. So um, they're probably the numbers that I can roughly do. Yeah. I, I mean, it's funny because it is so, so foreign dependent. I mean, my, even when I was like, my deadlift was always my best. So even when I was like 170 pounds, I was deadlifting around 500. And I remember being at the gym um, at my college gym and I did four or five for like 12 and then 14, I think one other week, but I could have easily taken a hundred pounds off that. And like you said, like do like a slower control. I mean, it's like, that's such a big factor, you know? And, and so uh, it's humbling when you do that. I, even this past weekend, I was at the beach with my brother and we worked out there and my best incline dumbbell bench was hundred pound dumbbells for 18 reps. And that's like the most I ever did. I was very happy with that this weekend. It's a ton. It, yeah. I mean, I was pretty proud of it and uh, I don't know what I could do now, but I did like <laughs> as a second exercise, I did eighties for 10. And I was like, what is now I haven't done this exercise in like over a year, but I was doing it a slow control. There was my second movement. And I was like, wow, like I did not expect this to be so hard and like just coming back to something and slowing it down, pausing. So, um, the, you know, and we've talked about this with other people recently where not everybody chooses to express or show their strength, you know, like Ronnie Coleman was known and, uh, branch Warren, they're known for like these like crazy weights and this like loose form and everything. But if you look at Jay Cutler, he was incredibly strong. He just didn't care to show it off. But when he yeah. occasionally did, he was probably almost as strong as Ronnie was. It's just, he would use slower uh, controlled reps and always stay like, I remember him saying like, this is bodybuilding. I don't go below 12 reps. Like he just never decided to do that. So um, a lot of times I think people like, like if you actually cared, you could probably do a six month, you know, power building phase and be break all of your personal best for strength. Yeah. You just don't care to do it, which is totally reasonable. No, absolutely. I, I always say that to some of my clients who are like, they want to go, like sometimes they get interested in doing that, but then after like a month of doing like a strength cycle, they're like, let's get back to bodybuilding. <laughs> <laughs> right, I was like, right. one more strength cycle and you'll have some crazy numbers to what you uh -huh. had before. They're like, nah, I yeah. don't care about it. <laughs> right, <had> right. <laughs> so like speaking of like camp, that's more focused on like the strength. I know um, this was probably two years ago now, but you guys worked with Jordan Peters, who was like really on like the other side of things. Um, he was, you know, I don't, he wasn't doing specifically like DC dog crap training, but he was in that camp of like heavy iron all the time, breaking records. And I, my understanding was like, that didn't like work out like that. You guys coached for a few months and then he maybe didn't like like the style. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Was it that like he came to you guys or, and like, what didn't he like about it? So it's hard for me to say too much because I wasn't the one he came to. Um, it was actually Pascal. So Pascal okay. worked with him. Uh, I don't think even, I'm not sure he even got through, he may have got through one mesocycle just about. Mm. And I think they were starting at like two RER uh, for a lot of things. And I think it was more so trying out like, low, like leaving some reps in reserve because I think he even said on the podcast, like he's always trained, he, like his whole life, he trained everything to failure every yeah. single time. Right. Uh, which I don't know if that's, fact <laughs> but he probably always <laughs> yeah. thought he was at least uh i can't speak for him but i think a lot of like there's that whole people have asked me before like do you think people who say they train to failure all the time always do and i'm like i think some of them think they do but like objectively like if i say i'm at three rar i might not be <laughs> mm -hmm. i might be at a four i might be at a two right. it's hard to know sometimes uh but yeah i think yeah it, it essentially i don't know how much i want to even say but i think jordan just didn't enjoy it. I would okay. put it that way. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I think that was the, the main thing. It just didn't fit his preferences. Yeah. And I honestly, personally, one month isn't enough for me to be able to say whether yeah. or not something is. Oh, wow. It was that short. It was like really, yeah, it was very short. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it he didn't give it enough time yeah. to really know if, if it would work for him, but it's not going to work for him if he's not sold on it or if right. it's not fitting his, if he's not enjoying it, he's not going to adhere to it. Yeah. So fair enough. Yeah. I mean, the belief in it is, is so important, right? I mean, obviously we have so much evidence that all these different camps can work. And, and if you don't believe in it, I mean, that's a huge part of it. Um, but also just what you enjoy. I mean, I know that I would have a hard time because I, I wouldn't say I've only done training to failure. I've, I've certainly tried many different things at this point, but um, there is a part of me that has a hard time backing off, which is probably why my volume is relatively low. I mean, I really only do 
six to, well, my back gets about 12 sets per week, but everything else gets like six, you know? Um, and that part of the reason I think that can work for me is because I push things very hard. Um, yeah. I'll sometimes do a rest pause or drop sets or things like that. And, um, that's just it, like, objectively you think, well, if you know, you could not push yourself, not kill yourself all the time and still get results when you want to do that. And like, logically, yes, but I guess there's just something in me where it's like, I just feel like I need to do more. Um, and maybe that's, you know, maybe that's like a flaw in, in myself, but it, uh, it's just something to do with the type of training that maybe that's cause like what I was taught early on, but it is interesting to see how much, like, if you believe in the system, you know, I think that's a big player. And, and like, before we started recording, we were talking about like coaching and things like that. And I, I think, you know, it, there are certain people that you just, you've known a long time or you connect with and, and when you have that connection with them, like you just, you give them the trust of a coach, you know, and like, I'm probably not a better coach than I was. I mean, obviously I try to grow all the time, but like, am I dramatically better at coaching now than before I had the podcast? No, but way more people are aware of me and they, you know, they know my style. And I'm sure with you too. I mean, your podcast has made so many people aware of you that it's like, okay, I know Steve Hall. I, I trust him. And if, somebody maybe is could be just as good of a coach as you but if somebody's like hey train with this person you don't even know that psychology is not there yeah no i think i think there may even be some studies on this where like two groups followed one group followed a program that was not kind of observed and the other group had like coaches taking them through the program and the ones that had the program that the coaches took them through did better because they're like i've got this guy who's a coach he knows what mm -hmm. he's doing this program yeah. must be better and well, we've seen this with like the st placebo steroid studies yeah. where it's like they give them the placebo pills and they grow better and then they're told and it's like, it all goes away. So if you think you've got the best coach in the world, I, I do this sometimes with my clients where they like give me props and I'm like, yeah, I'm the best coach in the world, <laughs> major gains with this program. I just big it up as much as possible because that's ultimately going to help them if they yeah. really believe in it. So uh, I definitely think there's a ton to that. So if you don't believe in something, so if you're going to give something a go and you don't ultimately actually think it's going to work, I think yeah. that's like lots of things in life. It's like getting into a relationship and you're like, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not sure it's the right thing. It's going to like your body will follow mind with what's happening there. So I think sure. belief and you can kind of yeah, placebo yourself in a way into find that the program is going to be awesome. So yeah, naming a program like something incredible right. is probably a good yeah. idea. <laughs> those uh, those steroid studies, though, man, I got to see those replicated because I understand like there's been like two of them now, I believe, but I just part of me just can't believe it. Like they're it's just crazy. too extreme. And the thing is, not only that though, but it's like okay, how do you explain to me then the myriad of people who take actual stuff and complain? that it's not working as they thought, you know, like there's no, we've all said how there's yeah. tons of people in commercial gyms who look like crap, right. Or who aren't as strong and, and they're actually surprisingly were on stuff. So they explain that to me then, you know, or like I've, I've told a classic story of like, not classic story, but like my, in my head that I told my brother, this is like a super unethical thing to do, but years <laughs> ago, um, I don't know if I told you this story, but I told him that beta alanine was steroids and he was like new to lifting. He had no idea. <laughs> so he's like a year in. And you'd think like, okay, so he really trusts my knowledge on this. He, he's like, you know, would believe it. And beta alanine is what I chose because you feel it, right? Yeah. So there's something to be said for feeling it. So he's like, oh man, like this is like really kicking in. <laughs> and I had him do a bench press and he hit the exact same weight and reps as the previous session. And I told him like, this is going to make you stronger. You're going to get more reps, no result at all. So when I hear these studies that like yeah. these people took something fake and they were already advanced lifters and they put on you know, 50 pounds to their total. I'm like, I got to see this replicated. I, I just don't fully believe it. Now I'm not doubting the placebo effect. There are many, many examples and studies behind it, but that steroid study, I gotta, I gotta see it to believe in that. <laughs> That's so hilarious that you did that with your brother. Yeah. Looking back, I was like, That's <laughs> a kinda... great story. Yeah. Well, I wanted to test it. So I was disappointed. Um, <laughs> so um, I did want to ask if you were eating this much while dieting, when you were at two or five, how much were you eating? It's a good question. I actually, I know it was my carbs got over 600 grams a day. Um, wow. So I was probably on like 240 protein and like 70 fat. I th that's probably like 4,500 calories or something. Okay. Wow. Somewhere around that amount. And yeah. I was trying to keep my steps down, but <laughs> they, they top up. So I probably averaged around 10,000 steps without trying. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. And then 
I think I just, I'm just like a furnace when that happens. And I yeah. end up just like being that person <laughs> that shuffles around, moves around a lot. Right. And like plays with the dogs more than I normally would. Was so, it not a lot of clean calories? Like in terms of like the stereotypical sense that like you mentioned a lot of pizzas and stuff, or was that like a one-off here and there? So yeah, it wasn't like a pizza a day or anything that would more so be like once a week though, maybe eating out twice a week uh, okay. would be pretty normal and maybe a takeaway and then one meal out with mm. uh, my girlfriend. Uh, and then, but a lot of the food was, I tried to do oats for as long as I could and then I had to get rid of oats because <laughs> I just couldn't stomach those. I had yeah. fruit juices. I would have soups to try and get the veg veggies in and the micronutrients. I mean, I, I didn't have to try to get fiber in because it would just tot up. Yeah, yeah. Most, a lot of it was cereal, uh, rice, bread. Cereal um, like Lucky Charm cereal or cereal like, like a oatmeal slash like healthy granola type of thing. I try and mix it up a little bit, but it was a lot of like Cocoa Pops and okay. stuff like that. I'm a big um, fan of like kid cereal personally. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, I am as well. Um, so, but it, even that, I just started really struggling. It would just be a big bowl of like Rice Krispies or Cocoa Pops okay. or whatever, like easy kid cereal to eat. Yeah. I was just like, I just can't stomach it. And yeah. I did mass gainers as well. Wow. So, I did, um, I think it's Optin Nutrition's mass gainer. Mm -hmm. uh, like serious mass okay. and that made me really like feel very sick and nauseous really? like I, I couldn't do that um I was to the point where I had a consultation with Gabby we we may have spoken about it where I thought I actually had like stomach yeah. issues yeah, yeah yeah as soon as I started dieting it all went away <laughs> oh yeah yeah I mean I so, had some pretty significant GI issues and like um I don't get too full uh, I've never really had that problem but definitely like a lot of GI distress and within like two weeks of dieting it like half of it is gone at least like it, it's so much better when I'm dieting so yeah it's not nice so I, I had to get rid of <laughs> I've, I may have the serious mass somewhere but I think it's going to be one of those things where I can never touch it yeah just like, right it's just... <laughs> uh, and I think that was partly down because I was trying to use it with such a low amount of fluids because oh, I didn't okay. want to stuff myself right. but because it's such an, a high amount of carbohydrates, it just really threw off like the osmality of it or something. Mm. I, I can't exactly remember, but it was pulling water into my gut essentially because yeah. there's just so much carbs. Did uh, she have you do anything feel... besides like when you dieted, you felt better, but were there other changes she made? Uh, she, I think I reduced dairy for a period of time to see if that would help. I went to lactose, like free uh, milks instead. It didn't really change, didn't change much. much. No, uh, and my she thought my fiber wasn't super high, but actually my fiber was like a good forty grams or so. Okay, uh, so yeah, there wasn't there wasn't anything obvious. Trial removing some supplements uh, didn't really seem to make a difference. Some like uh, nootropics and pre workouts, but didn't really. And she was fine with you having the indulgences like twice a week with the going out and eating and cereals. Yeah, she didn't seem to think that was a, a major concern. I don't think. Okay. Um, we only had one consultation, so it wasn't like a, she wasn't like yeah. coaching me through it or anything. Yeah, the so, GI yeah. stuff is very weird and individual. Like even with my like, you know, significant GI issues, like I don't have any problem with milk. Like if, if I'm having like a big refeed, I'll easily have like six to eight cups of milk with like kids cereal or something. And I'm like, fine. Um, mine more seems to be like as I eat more and more, it's more of like a systemic thing. And like, you know, I will have like chronic inflammation and everything. And so um, that's why I think, you know, with cutting, you do see lower levels of, um, TNF alpha, interleukin six, CRP, things that like markers of inflammation. So, um, and, and I don't know if that's related to what you had, but certainly for me, but it, like a given, I've never seen like this one thing, whether it's dairy or gluten or whatever, it's like always a problem for me, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, I forget whose diet is it the vertical diet mm -hmm. uh, by Stan Efting. You may yeah, have yeah. even had him on. Uh, I did talk yeah. about it. Yeah. And I, I kind of understood it a little bit more after mm -hmm. experiencing that where these massive bodybuilders, yeah, they have to somehow get this food in. So right. I can see why he may just go to these like easy to eat foods, right? Like, yeah. Lots of salt to make it palatable, yeah. that sort of thing. Like, white and, rice and steak yeah. and beef, things like that. Yeah, for sure. The stuff that digests well. I kind of got it a little bit more yeah. because otherwise, I mean, that could also be awful because imagine if all those things didn't sit with you well. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> So, so, well, I know we're kind of limited on time today. I got a patient in like five minutes or so, but okay. uh, I appreciate you taking the time, man. Congratulations on that victory. And I, I know that was like a really big deal for you. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more throughout your season. And uh, anybody who's not familiar with you, where can they find more of your stuff? 
yeah thank you very much for indulging me it's always good to chat and yeah uh, yeah uh so revivestronger.com is for our coaching member site all of that good stuff our podcast as well or you can find us on spotify just search the revive stronger podcast and then i'm on instagram at revive stronger so if anyone wants to to know follow along uh, they can do that there awesome thanks again man